Well, what a way to lead into the season finale next week. So much happened in Episode 7 of The Gilded Age across all of the characters' stories that it quite literally leaves the stakes being so high in the season finale. With Oscar losing nearly all of the Van Rijn's money on an investment opportunity that didn't even exist, Reverend Forte meeting his end and the war between the Met and the Academy livening up, let's jump into the episode and discuss all that there was to take away from it. So let's get into it. Here is The Gilded Age Season 2 Episode 7 Ending Explained. Just to let you know, this video will contain spoilers. Oscar has lost the fortune. For Oscar, this is the worst that we've seen him. Whilst all of us were predicting that he was a victim to a well-known scam of the time, he was none the wiser. And what made it even more painful for him was the fact that Miss Beaton, somebody who he cared for and thought was good company and was even going to propose to, was behind the scheme too. After Oscar spoke to George Russell about the company that he invested in, Casterbridge Pacific, George revealed that he hadn't heard of it before, which made Oscar slightly concerned because it was a competitor of George for that specific project. Upon hearing that, Oscar went to the office where he saw that it was cleared out and there was no trace of the company ever existing. Then, afterwards, he went to Miss Beaton's property and she wasn't there. She wasn't there because it was never her property in the first place. She'd just told Oscar that that was where she lived. He'd never been inside and we never saw her leave the front door. If you remember, a couple of episodes back, she was waiting outside when Oscar arrived. And he said to her, you don't have to wait on the curbside. And she said that she was just getting some air. But in reality, it was because she'd probably just walked there and waited to make it seem like she was living there. So Oscar was in a deep mess. It was during the conclusion of the episode where we saw just how much of a mess that Oscar was in. And the impact that it would not only have on him, but on the entire family. After returning home, he mentioned to Agnes that he had invested not only his money, but most of the Van Rijn's money meaning that they were on the cusp of being penniless due to Oscar's actions. Something which is an added weight of stress following everything that had gone on with Reverend Forte and the fact that he died in the episode. With Mr. Crowther and Miss Beaton upping and leaving and it looking like they never even existed, it seems like it's going to be hard to track them down in order to retrieve what was stolen. So this could have devastating, long-lasting effects on the family. So it's going to be really interesting watching them navigate this new space which could alter their lives forever. Marion's Conflict Poor Marion. I mean, she's in a mess too. Dashiel and her are set to be getting married and it's clear that it's something that she doesn't want. During the luncheon that was taking place at the beginning of the episode, we saw that she was keen on not rushing wedding plans, even though Agnes and everybody else wanted to. Plus, we also saw her asking Peggy if she was right to have accepted Dashiell's proposal, to which Peggy responded by asking if she was trying to convince herself. There were also other moments in this episode where Agnes told Marion to make Dashiell some tea when he arrived, something that she didn't really want to do, and nor would she do if she wasn't his wife-to-be. Plus, when he left the property, she seemed to have a weight lifted off of her, as if to say that there was a moment for her to just be without him and to be able to breathe. Marion is an independent, progressive woman, and it feels like being married to Dashiell is something that's going to be more restrictive in terms of her life and growth as a person. Hence why it feels like she doesn't really want to get married to him, yet she's fearful of saying no, because she knows that she doesn't want to let down the rest of the family. What was interesting in this episode was the moment that Dashiell left, none other than Mr. Larry Russell crossed the street, and we saw that he was there for her in the most comforting of ways. Marion's face lit up the moment that she saw him, and she smiled, something that she didn't do at all in this episode. He offered to be there for her and to comfort her, following her being upset for Ada over the death of Reverend Forte. Something that I thought was quite small and not connected, but I think is on a grander scale, is the fact that Larry Russell stood up for Mrs. Roebling in this episode and allowed her to have the recognition and praise that she deserved in front of the crowd over her involvement in leading the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge something which everybody was celebrating. This is progressive of Larry, which, as we saw, is the complete opposite to Dashiell. Whilst it wasn't connected in story, I think it was connected in terms of showing us the polar opposite of Larry and Dashiell's personalities, and how Marion is more similar to Larry. After watching the trailer for the finale, it seems like Marion is definitely going to be taking up more interest in Larry in the final episode, so I think the romance that we're all expecting to happen might just happen. Whilst I don't think the wedding will be called off just yet, we might end up seeing a kiss or something like that. Bertha vs. the Academy 
There's not actually been much of a focus on Mrs. Winterton in the past couple of episodes, eh? I'm hoping we get her in the finale along with a ton of drama too. But anyway, Bertha found herself in a difficult predicament in this episode as we saw that Mrs. Astor offered her a box at the Academy, something which she always wanted. In fact, the only reason she started working on the Metropolitan was because she thought that if she couldn't join them, she'd go at it alone. This was a decision that was plaguing her mind and she was on the cusp of joining. However, George talked her out of it, mentioning how at the Met she'd have the control to be able to make it bigger and better than the Academy, whilst also not needing to live in Mrs. Astor's shadow. Two things which appealed to her, so much so that when she declined the offer to Mrs. Astor, it was in a full room of well-respected peers. So Mrs. Astor ended up getting embarrassed, which in turn made her act on phase two of her plan, taking the Duke away from Bertha, something which was apparent during the celebrations of the Brooklyn Bridge being opened. This is something that's definitely going to tie into the war of the opera houses, and it looks like the Duke could end up going to the Academy, which would in turn ruin the reputation of the Met on its opening night. So Bertha is going to have to think of a way in which she can lure him back so that she can have the upper hand. This might be where we essentially see Bertha offering up her daughter again like she did over the dinner in the hopes of getting the Duke to attend, but I guess we'll see if that does end up happening. Peggy and Mr. Fortune Peggy and Mr. Fortune are growing closer for sure, and I think the feelings are reciprocated on both sides. However, Dorothy has cottoned onto it and has expressed her opinion on the fact that she doesn't agree with it. One thing I want to know is, where is Mr. Fortune's wife in all of this? We've not seen her in this season, and considering how he's so clearly looking to be with Peggy, I kind of just want to know what the situation is like with his wife. Are they okay? Is she dead? I just want to know. Peggy and the black community in the city are fighting the case against the education board wanting to close down the school for black students, and we saw them take their steps in moving the fight against it forward. We saw that they got Marion on side, a white person, somebody that the educational board would listen to, and they also recruited Mr. Patrick Ryan as a teacher, a white Irishman who said that he could also get many other white Irish teachers to teach at the school. So they're making the right steps in order to look to get the schools integrated, Considering that that is the only way that they feel they're going to be able to keep the schools up and running and black teachers in their jobs. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this story in the season finale and if it'll prove to be successful. Mr. Watson and Flora McNeil Within this episode, we saw that Flora went to the Russell's property and spoke with her father, Mr. Watson. We found out exactly what we suspected, which was that Mr. McNeil hadn't spoken with her over the deal that he offered Mr. Watson in order to get out of the city and to move to the West Coast. He was doing it behind her back and it was something that she didn't want to happen. During their scene together, she offered him an apartment in the city and told him that he could live under his actual name and be known as a retired banker, but most importantly, her father allowing him to integrate in their circles and live a more privileged lifestyle, whilst being able to see his grandchildren, something which he always wanted. He cared deeply for Flora, and that was something which was apparent throughout the entirety of the bargaining that was taking place in the previous episodes. I just wonder if there's going to be any friction from Mr. McNeil in all of this new deal. George Russell Despite seeing a good side to George Russell in the previous episode in calling off the attack on the strikers, it seems like it was all part of a wider plan that he's got going on. He made a deal with the tradesmen to up their wages on a six-month contract to also improve working conditions and finally to build a part for the community. But with it only going to the tradesmen and not to the laborers, his plan is to split the workers' union when the laborers eventually kick up a fuss. He also mentioned how a strike in the past took place, and the strikers were fired at, and it persuaded the public to side with the strikers and cause a large amount of sympathy to be present, and that was something that he wanted to avoid. George never acknowledged the union, and despite him having a plan and knowing what he's doing, he's lost the support of the other businessmen, and now he's on his own, something that could weaken his position. Mr. Henderson, the person who led the strike in the previous episode, was aware of what George's plan was, and he said the only reason that he accepted the offer was because George called off the firing when he could have let it happen. So even though George may have alternative motives, I feel there is some good inside of George, and he won't screw the people over. We saw how he was when he visited Mr. Henderson's home and the community. I think he could be changing. Overall review. I thought this was a good episode of the show. It was a great way to ease into the season finale. I was going to do a whole section covering Mr. Forte's death, but there's not that much that needs explaining about it. 
My only thing with this is I just feel it all happened a bit too quickly. In the space of what felt like a few days, he just died. But I guess that's just TV. I like the fact that all arms of the story have reached a point where they're so tense and on the cusp of going off the edge. For example, Bertha and the Opera War, Marion and her marriage to Dashiell, the Van Ryn family and their lost fortune, and Peggy and Mr. Fortune. Everything's at a point where it will either go well or not, and that's a great place to be before a season finale. I think this second season of the show has been a good one, and it's a bittersweet feeling knowing that it's coming to an end. I'm just hoping that we'll find out if there's going to be a season 3 before season 2 concludes, because at least we'll have more to look forward to. Oh yeah, something I forgot to mention was Jack's story and the fact that he got accepted into the watchmaking society due to Mr. Schubert, which now means that his patent might be considered, so it very much feels like Jack could be moving on to bigger and better things, something that the character deserves. Also, is anybody else getting fed up with Mrs. Armstrong's negativity? She can't be happy for anyone. But anyway, bring on the final episode. So, there you have it. The Gilded Age Season 2 Episode 7 Ending Explained